Adaptive grazing is just simply a very flexible or adaptable system that allows us to be able to change according to the altering conditions that we experience every day out here on the landscape. Nothing ever stays the same. So therefore our grazing can't stay the same. So it's just an incredibly adaptive or flexible system that we utilize each and every day. There's a handful of key benefits to adaptive grazing. First of all, adaptive grazing produces the greatest amount of results in the shortest period of time. And we are working with people, including ourselves, that have been doing this now for several decades. And we, the second is that we have not hit a threshold. We are continuing to produce good results. Therefore, the third is that through proper adaptive grazing implementation, we can realize continuous incremental progress. And the fourth point is that adaptive grazing produces the highest and most consistent level of profitability compared to any other method of grazing that we can utilize. There's a number of keys to adaptive grazing. The first is that it is goal oriented and it allows us to be able to tackle multiple goals and objectives all at the same time. The second is that it is predicated on stock density, meaning pounds per acre, rather than stocking rate. And a quick definition of stocking rate is head per acre or acres required per head. So it's all about the pounds of animal that we're putting on an acre, not the number of head. Another key to adaptive grazing is frequent movement and frequent rest. We want to move our animals as much as we can. We like to move them at least once daily, and many times we'll move them multiple times a day, and then give long rest periods in between each grazing event on any particular paddock or pasture. So another key to adaptive grazing is plant root system recovery. Most grazers have been taught to focus on what they see growing above the ground. And when they see a plant return to a certain height or a certain number of leaves on that plant, they deem that they have full recovery and therefore they're able to go back and graze that pasture again. But what we want to focus on with an adaptive grazing is what's going on beneath the soil surface with that same plant. So we really want to pay attention to full plant root system recovery that's very critical to what we're doing here. To really adequately achieve adaptive grazing, it's highly reliant on temporary fencing technology, such as what we see out here today. We've got a lot of single strand high tensile fence. We've got poly wire with tread in post. This fence can easily be taken up and put down on a daily basis. Sometimes this temporary fencing technology may not be practical. So instead of relying on that, we can rely on herding. And our livestock can train up very quickly to herd without much of a problem. And we can use cowboys and cowgirls on horseback, train dogs, shepherds, those types of things to be able to effect daily movement of our livestock where we want them and under the density that we wish to have them for any particular day. One of the people that I really admire is the famous French biochemist and grazer, Andre Voisson. And Voisson taught us that overgrazing while being understocked is one of the most detrimental impacts that we can have. If we have a single cow grazing on 10 acres, but she's continuously grazing those 10 acres for an entire grazing season, that one cow can kill thousands of plants. But at the same time, if we put a thousand cows on those same 10 acres for just a few hours that day, they will not kill a single plant. So that one cow did what we called overgrazing while being understocked, while the much larger group of cattle actually produced a very positive compounding and cascading effect 
that is gonna benefit us for a very long time period afterwards. What we want to do is to create biomimicry and ecomimicry. Biomimicry means that we are mimicking what the biology is doing in the soil, the biology of the plants, the biology of the animals around us. So we can take our domesticated livestock, for instance, and we can use them as a biomimicry substitute for wild ruminants that used to exist in that same area. Ecomimicry means that we're trying to utilize the entire system around us to recreate and reestablish that historical ecological perspective or ecosystem that I talked about earlier. So by combining biomimicry and ecomimicry, we're able to revitalize, restore and rebuild and regenerate a fully functioning ecosystem. So one of the first things that we do is we have to be able to estimate the amount of dry matter available to us on a daily basis in any given pasture. So Shane has just handed me what we call a grazing stick, so a four-sided yardstick. And what we want to do is we want to measure both forage height and stand density to be able to accurately estimate the amount of dry matter that we have available out here and we take the average height of each of the dominant forage species, and then we get an overall average based on what our livestock are going to eat. So we have a grass here, we have some orchard grass. Now I do not want to measure stalk and stem and seed head. I want to measure plant leaf material only. So I would pull that up and measure that, and I see that I got an average of about 20 four inches in height there. So what we would do is we would go around to different locations in this pasture that we're getting ready to graze, and we would repeat those measurements until we come up with what we feel is a reasonable average for that particular plant. Now we also have some clover here, so I would do the same thing with the clover. This is white clover, so we have about 10 inches there. So we also have some forbs in here, and I see dandelion right here at Shane's feet. So if I go down and I pull up the leaf material on the dandelion and measure those, and again, in multiple places, I find that I have an average height of 12 inches in the dandelion. We haven't had the time today to go measure the entire paddock, but let's assume that our average height overall is 16 inches. The second thing that we want to do is determine stand density because that's going to tell us based on the height how much dry matter we have per inch per acre. So the way to measure density is to take our forage stick and to slip it into our stand. So we want it at the bottom, running right along the soil surface. Then we're going to stand over that and look directly down. And we're going to determine the percentage of that stick that is visible. So if we look here, we see that we have less than 10% of our measuring stick that is actually visible, looking straight down on that stick. So once I have that, I can remove our forage stick and now we can do our calculation. So now we know that we have an average stand height out here in this paddock of 16 inches, and we know that we have an average stand density of greater than 90%. And if we have a stand density of 90% or higher, we estimate that we have 300 pounds of available dry matter for every inch of plant height. So 16 times 300 gives us 4,800 pounds of total forage dry matter available in this paddock. Now, we do not want our livestock to consume more than 50% of the plant leaf material that is available. So if we have 4,800 pounds per acre available, then we're going to divide that 
by half and we only want to consume a maximum of 2,400 pounds of plant leaf material. So now we can determine how big to build our paddock based on the total pounds of livestock and their daily dry matter requirements. There's a number of other very important considerations that we have to pay attention to. Every animal has to have water every single day. So locating our water source for that paddock that we're getting ready to graze is gonna be critically important. If it's hot, we've gotta also locate a shade source or pull in temporary shade facilities for those animals. The other thing that we have to consider is the performance of those animals. So if they're, for instance, grass finishers and they're in the final finishing stage, then we want to consider that we may not want them eating as much as 50% of what's available out there. I may want them to only eat 25 to 30% so that they have the greatest amount of gain every single day, every 24 hour period. We also want to take into account animal comfort for every hour of every day while they're out here. And one of the best ways to create high levels of animal comfort is to make sure that we've always got our ground covered and we're protecting that soil moisture and soil temperature. The lower the temperature of the soil, the more comfortable our livestock are going to be. It creates a capillary cooling effect, similar to the way that a radiator works that allows their bodies to cool through the blood system. The other thing that we want to consider is paddock configuration, the shape that we build that paddock. Our livestock are going to naturally move through any given area. And if we construct a paddock in the proper configuration for that particular area, then our livestock are going to make greater utilization of that particular paddock. Bricks is just simply a measure of total nutrient density in the sap of a plant. We use an instrument called a refractometer, but what we measure in those dissolved solids is comprised of plant sugars, proteins, free amino acids, lipids, pectins, and minerals. Now the reason we measure bricks is because this allows us to be able to get an accurate determination of the performance that we can expect from our livestock as they're grazing this pasture at this particular point in time. Bricks varies according to time of day. It varies according to the stage of maturity of a plant. It varies according to microbial activity and mineral cycling in the soil, and it varies according to whether we're sunny or cloudy or rainy. To measure bricks so that we're accurate and repeatable, we want to make sure that we're measuring bricks in the afternoon and that we are measuring it on sunny or partly cloudy days only. Now, the reason we measure it in the afternoon is because bricks varies for every 24 hour photo period and it reaches its peak sometime in the afternoon. Every day as the sun sets, then these plant carbohydrates start to migrate to the base of that plant and into the roots for the evening. As the sun rises the next day and photosynthetic activity starts to kick up again, then those plant carbohydrates start to migrate back up that plant and they don't reach their peak concentration in the leaf material of the plant and the tops of that leaf material until sometime in the afternoon. So what we're going to do to actually measure bricks is we're going to first observe what our livestock are actually eating. And then those are the portions of the plant that we want to collect for our plant material to measure that bricks. And we want to measure bricks in a single plant species at a time. So we're gonna measure grass today to show you how to do this. We're going to pluck the plant leaf and blade material that we saw our cattle eat. Uh, 
until we get a reasonable amount of that material. Then we're going to take it and wad it up into our hand and I just vigorously roll it around in my palms until I feel moisture against the surface of my palms. That tells me that I've started breaking the cellular wall so it's easier to extract that plant sap. Then we can use either a garlic press or a vice press, either one. The garlic press works very well if we have nice green plant material. Once that plant material gets drier, the vice grip press becomes much better as a tool for doing that job. And we want to use a pulsing motion to best extract the sap from these plants. Not a constant steady squeeze, but a pulsing squeezing motion. And we quickly put three to four drops on the stage of our refractometer. We take the cover, gently lower that, so that we spread a thin film of that plant sap across that stage. Now what we want to do is we want to hold this up to the light, and in this case, the sunlight, and there's an internal scale. And this internal scale goes from zero to 30. The higher the number, the greater the percent bricks, and the better those animals are gonna perform. So in this case today, in the orchard grass, that we're testing, we have 10% bricks. Double digit bricks is what we're hoping for to get optimal performance in our animals. So adaptive grazing, again, is not a recipe, a formula, or a prescription. It is the best method of grazing that we have ever been able to utilize. It's been successfully utilized in every, virtually every country in the world now to a very high level of success. And as long as we remember the one key thing, keep it flexible, keep it adaptive, then we will be continuously regenerative in what we do out here grazing this landscape.